So hello everyone, welcome to the lecture on 3D computer vision. And today we are going to talk about the generalized cameras. Hopefully, by the end of today's lecture, you'll be able to use the Blucher line representation that we have learned earlier on in our lectures to derive the generalized epipolar geometry that relates to views of a generalized camera. Next, we will look at how to apply the linear 17-point algorithm to compute the relative pose between the two view of a generalized camera. And then we'll look at how to explain the degeneracy cases of a generalized epipolar geometry. In particular, we'll look at three cases, the locally centered projection axial cameras and the locally central and axial camera configuration. Finally, We'll learn how to compute the absolute pose of a generalized camera using 2D, 3D point or line correspondences. Today, I'm not going to say that I didn't invent any of today's material because indeed I did uh, invented two of the materials that we are going to talk about today. So uh, I took mainly four references for today's lecture. The first uh, is the paper written by Robert Plass using many cameras as one. In particular, I took uh, from this paper, the derivation of the generalized epipolar geometry. And I took uh, the degeneracy cases, the three degeneracy cases that we are going to look at from the paper written by Hong Dong Li, a linear approach to motion estimation using generalized camera models. And I took the generalized post estimation from point correspondence from this paper that I have written in 2015, Minimal Solutions for the Multi-Camera Post Estimation Problem. Finally, I took the non-perspective post estimation from line correspondences uh, from this paper that I have written in uh, 2016 in ECCV. And I strongly encourage all of you to look at these papers after today's lecture. So, so far in all our lectures, we have been looking at the pinhole camera model where uh, all the light rays that comes into the standard pinhole camera converge at a particular point, which is to, uh, the camera center. So this is the uh, image and all the light rays are going to uh, come in and project onto the image, but they will all converge uh, at a single center of projection known as the camera center. One illustration here uh, would be in the two view geometry of a pinhole camera. We can see that lights that are reflected from these 3D points into the pinhole camera converges at a single center of convergence. And uh, this is true for uh, the two views that is shown here. In contrast, light rays do not meet at a single center of convergence in the generalized camera. So we can think of a generalized camera where the lens is a general shape. It can be something like in the shape of a funhouse mirror. So that's, this is a arbitrary uh, shape. What it means is that the light rays that are being projected into the cameras, they do not meet at a single center of projection. So here, uh, this is an illustration of a two-view generalized camera where we can see that the light rays that are reflected from the 3D points in the environment do not converge at a single center of projection here. So all these light rays, they are in arbitrary locations. Of course, in reality, the funhouse mirror lens, this funhouse mirror lens that uh, projects light ray into arbitrary config configuration, it does not exist in reality. But uh, a generalized camera can be realized with a multi-camera system with minimal or without any overlapping field of view. Here's two examples of the uh, multi-camera system that I have worked with uh, in the past. So uh, the first example here, it's a drone system where we mounted four cameras that look in four different directions. We can see that uh, from this camera setup, there are minimal uh, field of view between the front forward-looking camera and the backward-looking camera. And here's another example uh, where we mounted four cameras on a self-driving car, one looking forward and one looking uh, backward and two at the side mirrors. So we can see here that uh, there's minimal overlapping field of view between these four cameras. And this is uh, generally known as the generalized camera. The reason is because, let's look at this illustration over here. 
suppose that I have a camera here and another camera here. We can see that all these light rays uh, from the first camera that we saw here, uh, it's going to project at a single center of projection. And this is true for another camera that is mounted rigidly on this uh, vehicle. So here, uh, let's look at the second camera. It's also going to project light rays that are going to uh, converge as a single center of projection. However, the two points of convergence, they do not meet or they are not the same point here. So we can see that uh, given an arbitrarily configured number of cameras that are rigidly fixed onto the vehicle here, we can see there are numerous point of projections over here and they generally do not meet at a single point. So here, this would be an example of how the generalized cameras can be realized in a physical system. And the reason of why we chose a multi-camera system is because cameras are generally low cost and easy to maintain compared to other kind of sensors uh, configuration or sensor setup, such as the LiDAR sensor. LiDAR sensor is a laser sensor, and this is uh, generally much more expensive compared to a, a camera. And because there are ro many rotating parts on the LiDAR sensor, and we know that generally more sophisticated uh, mechanical systems means that it's uh, more difficult to maintain it and uh, it's also more susceptible to mechanical failure. But in contrast, for cameras, there's no moving parts at all. So it's generally easier to maintain and less susceptible to any uh, failures. And of course, uh, it's also low cost. For a LiDAR sensor that we see on uh, some of the self-driving cars out there, the unit price is about in the order of uh, 60,000 uh, USD. Where for a, a, a industrial camera, the very high-end ones, it probably will only cost you up to $1,000 to, to buy. So this means that we can easily gather uh, many of these cameras and put it together in one particular uh, uh, system that we wish to operate on. And uh, another advantage of the multiple camera system is that we can easily choose the configuration such that it maximizes the field of view. So for example, in this car for, uh, here, where we chose four of these cameras, the multi-camera system, uh, such that we can achieve an uh, omnidirectional uh, view here. This means that uh, we the coverage would be 360 degrees. We get a surround view of, by just mounting four cameras in four different directions. And we will also see in today's lecture that in the, in the mathematics derivation of the generalized epipolar geometry, that absolute scale uh, can be obtained directly from the epipolar geometry. So epipolar geometry, as what we have learned earlier on in the lectures, uh, when we look at fundamental matrices, in, uh, in a single camera, we, we have two views. We saw that this is related by uh, essential matrix or fundamental matrix. Uh, so in the case of a calibrated camera, it will be essential matrix. And we saw that this can be decomposed into the rotation and translation vector. But in a single central camera configuration, we saw that we can only uh, obtain up to five degrees of freedom. The decomposition of an essential matrix into the relative pose of a relative rotation and a relative translation, where the translation is only known up to scale. So this guy over here is known up to a scale. And uh, in today's lecture, we'll see that given two generalized images, we can relate them using the epipolar geometry where here we can see that uh, uh, we will derive something that is known as the generalized essential matrix GEM. And then we'll see that we can decompose this as well uh, into the rotation and translation vector. But in this particular case here, the translation vector will contain absolute scale. This means uh, we know the absolute matrix scale of this guy over here. And this means that there are altogether six degrees of freedom, uh, which we can obtained from the generalized essential matrix. However, there are challenges to the generalized epipolar geometry. That is, that when we have a multiple camera system to, to realize the generalized camera, there would be no or minimal overlapping field of view as what we have mentioned earlier on. And this simply means that the stereo uh, setup or the, st the mathematics, the physics behind stereo cannot be used directly here. 
And the next challenge uh, we will see is that we can mitigate this particular problem of no or overlap, minimal overlapping field of view by processing each camera independently. This means that uh, I will just treat the multiple camera system. For example, if I have a car here and I mount four cameras here. So one argument could be that uh, after I have moved this multiple camera system uh, from one location to another, I could simply treat this camera, the same camera as one camera, uh, epipolar geometry, which we have learned in the earlier lecture. That means that I can compute the essential matrix of each one of these uh, cameras independently from each other. And then uh, we can uh, think of a way to aggregate these essential matrices that we have computed from the multiple camera system together to get the relative uh, translation and rotation. However, the problem with this is that it's computationally inefficient and we will not be able to identify or we will not be able to get the absolute scale if we do it this way. The reason is because we are treating every single camera independently. We are not making use of the relative uh, locations or the relative extrinsic calibration between this camera. As we will see later in the lecture that this actually helps us to get the absolute scale. So the solution here that we are going to introduce in this particular lecture on how to use a multiple camera system uh, efficiently would be to use what we call the generalized camera formulation. In particular, we'll look at the generalized epipolar geometry. So in contrast with the single pinhole camera model, where there is a single center of projection, in that case, all the light rays here are going to be projected onto a single center of projection. So in that particular case here, we can see that we can easily or conveniently assign a reference frame uh, to this particular single center of projection where every pixel in the image can also be conveniently represented using the homogeneous coordinates. So they are coherent in the sense that there is a single center of projection, a single reference frame that binds all of them together. Hence, we can see that, for example, in this case here, if this is uh, this coordinate here is x and y, we can easily uh, call this x, y, and 1. Uh, in this particular uh, illustration over here. And all the pixels here, they are all going to be related uh, via this particular single center of projection, this reference frame that is attached to the single center of projection. Uh, in contrast, uh, in the case of a generalized camera, since all the light rays, they are all going to be projected arbitrary, in arbitrary uh, locations. So here, we cannot conveniently choose a single reference frame. Uh, and we'll see that uh, it becomes inconvenient to stick on to the standard uh, homogeneous representation that we have seen earlier on for points. Uh, hence, we're going to introduce the use of Plucker vectors. This means that all these pixels on the generalized uh, images for example, this particular point here, suppose that is called x, y, we're not going to represent this particular homogeneous coordinates that we have seen in the standard pinhole camera uh, because there's no single point of convergence over here. So what we are going to do here is that we're going to arbitrarily assign a reference frame here with respect to the generalized camera uh, setup. And we are going to represent every single point on the generalized image as a light ray that is with respect to this particular uh, reference frame that we have uh, defined uh, or we have attached to the generalized camera. And we can see that this is going to be convenient. The reason is because we have seen earlier on in the first uh, two lectures that for a Plucker vector, we can represent it using a six-dimensional 6D vector, where the first three vector represents the directional vector, which we denote as Q over here. And the next three vector would be uh, representing the moment vector that we denote as uh, Q prime. So what this means is that uh, for any light ray that we have seen, so suppose that this is the light ray that uh, projects onto our generalized image, we can assign a general reference frame over here. And then the first three vector 
of the Plucker coordinate that represents this particular pixel on the generalized image would be the directional vector of this light ray, which we denote as Q here. So this would be a unit vector in the direction of this uh, light ray that we denote as Q over here. And then the moment vector here, it will be simply the cross product of any point on this particular line. So here we can arbitrarily uh, choose a point which we call P over here. And the cross product of this P which is a vector that is from the reference frame over here. So note that the directional vector of Q over here would also be expressed with respect to this reference frame that we have chosen for the generalized uh, camera system. And P here would uh, be a point or a vector that is defined from the reference frame. And Q prime, the moment vector, would be the cross product of this P, this point over here, and the unit directional vector of the first three entries in the Plucker vector uh, as given by this equation over here. Hence, as a result, uh, we will get this particular line, which we can denote as L over here, to be equals to Q transpose, Q prime transpose, and transpose. So this means that this is a 6D vector, where the first three entries of this 6D vector is our unit direction of the light ray, and the last three entries in the unit vector would be the moment vector that is computed from the cross product of the unit direction and any point on the line. Hence, as a result, uh, we know that since Q prime is obtained from the cross product of uh, Q with any point that lies on the line, what this means is that Q and Q prime would be octagonal to each other. Hence, the dot product of these two entities in the Plucker vector should always be equal to zero because they are octagonal to each other. And the remaining five parameters are also homogeneous. This means that their over skills uh, does not affect the line that they describe. And it is convenient to force the directional vector to be unit vector because as what we have mentioned here is that the scale of the direction does not matter at all. So hence, uh, we will just conveniently choose the first three entries or the directional vector in the Plucker line, which is Q and uh, Q transpose and Q prime transpose over here. So we'll conveniently choose the direction uh, vector to be a unit vector. And this also defines the scale, or rather we fix the scale at unit scale for the homogeneous coordinates. And once we have defined the Plucker line to be this guy over here, what it means is that the set of points, all the points that lies on the Plucker line, suppose that this is a generalized image where there's a light ray over here, and we define this light ray to be L equals to Q transpose, Q prime, transpose, transpose, with respect to a, a arbitrary reference frame that is fixed according to the general uh, camera system. Here is any points on this particular line would be given by this equation over here, where it's a Q cross Q prime plus alpha Q. Uh, what the first uh, term over here means is that we're expressing this to be the base point or the closest point to the reference frame from the this particular light ray L over here. So this means that this is the closest point to the reference frame given by Q cross Q prime over here. And uh, hence, any point on this particular line would be in the direction of the line, which is given by Q and taken at a certain regular interval that is scaled by uh, this uh, scalar value of alpha over here. For example, this particular point here, it will be in the direction from Q cross Q prime. That's the closest point to the reference frame of the line. And uh, it will be taken at a certain unit uh, of this uh, Q, which is the direction or uh, in the Plucker light ray. And here we'll refer to alpha as the sine distance from that point, because uh, this alpha over here, when it's positive, it will tell us that it's moving in this direction according to the unit direction of the Plucker line. And if it is negative, it means uh, we are looking behind the, the opposite direction of the Plucker line. Since we are looking at a multiple camera system set up, our generalized camera will be made up of uh, multiple uh, cameras 
that are fixed rigidly together. For example, in the car system that we have seen earlier on, we have four cameras that are looking in four different octagonal directions. In the case where the reference frame for this general camera system can be chosen arbitrarily anywhere on this fixed rigid body that contains the multiple cameras set up. And in the case where we choose a reference frame to be on the center of projection for one particular camera, suppose that this camera we call CI over here. So what this means is that all the light rays are going to converge at a single center of projection, which coincides with the reference frame for this particular camera in the multiple camera system set up. And here, uh, a pixel sample along this light ray would be X and Y. So what this means is that we are also seen in our earlier lectures that uh, given a pixel on an image over here so as X and Y, we can easily compute the directional vector that corresponds to this particular pixel in the image. And that can be given by the normalized camera coordinate, uh, where KCI over here represents the intrinsic camera calibration matrix of this particular pinhole camera that makes up the multi-camera system. So here, by uh, doing this, we will be able to find the unit direction along the Joker vector that represents this light ray over here. So this means that this guy over here will give us the first three entries of our Plucker coordinate, which is known as Q. And since in this particular case, we fix the reference frame of the multiple camera system set up to coincide with this camera CI over here. So this means that a point that lies on this particular light ray can be conveniently chosen as the origin of this reference frame, since all the light rays are going to pass through this particular point over here. And this is also the point which contains the reference frame. Uh, and this means that this point can be conveniently chosen as a 0, 0, 0 here. So what this means is that uh, Q prime can be computed from Q cross P, where Q here is, uh, is from the normalized camera coordinates that we find here in this particular case. And P here would be any point on this light ray and we can conveniently choose P to be equals to uh, the origin since we have fixed the uh, reference frame to be on the convergence point of the camera. So here, uh, what this means is that Q prime over here can be conveniently chosen as the vector of 0, 0, 0. And in the case where the camera center is not at the origin, so what it means is that because we have multiple camera system here, for example, in the car system that I've shown earlier on, uh, we have four cameras. We can, uh, as mentioned in the uh, previous slide, we can choose the reference frame to be coincidence with one of the camera center. But what this means is that this reference frame cannot be coincidence with all the other remaining cameras. So as a result, the last moment vector, the last three entries of the Plucker coordinates cannot be zero anymore for all the remaining uh, cameras in the uh, multiple camera system setup. So here we have to look at how to compute the Plucker light ray of all the light rays that passes through these cameras in general. So here we will define CI over here, which is the camera center to be not at the origin. So since we already chosen the reference frame to be at the origin, or otherwise we can also choose the reference frame to be in general anywhere on this particular uh, rigid body where all the four different cameras or multi-camera systems are rigidly fixed onto the body. Uh, we will further assume that the respective cameras are calibrated. That means that we have the calibration matrix, the intrinsic calibration matrix, which we call KCI, that represents the uh, ith camera on our multiple camera system. And we will also assume that we have the extrinsic calibrations of this multiple camera system set out. So what it means is that, suppose uh, we fix the reference frame to be here, for example. The extrinsic calibration simply means that for a camera CI, we will know the relative transformation, which we denote as uh, R, CI, and TCI. That brings the camera to the frame of the reference that we have defined here. And uh, this can be easily found from uh, calibration methods that we have described earlier, earlier on. 
And so in this particular case here, where the reference frame are not at the origin of any of this camera system, we can see that the directional uh, vector would be the uh, given by this particular equation over here. So in this case here, we, we have x and y to be a pixel on the image for that particular uh, camera that we are that we are looking at and since the reference frame is somewhere else suppose that this is the reference frame over here which we call f uh, w over here and we'll see that q that is computed from the normalized camera image coordinates over here would be in the direction or with respect to the local frame of that particular camera that contains this particular uh, image pixel or this particular light ray. Uh, but we have to do an additional step, that is to transform this uh, vector, which we can we can call Q tilde over here, because this is with respect to that particular camera. Uh, we need to transform this directional vector into the frame of the reference frame of the generalized camera. So uh, this can be done easily by transforming it according to a rotation. This is because this guy here, Q tilde, is just a directional vector in the direction of the light ray. So in order to transform this directional vector into the frame of the generalized camera, we can pre-multiply this with the rotation of the camera intrinsics for that particular camera. So this would give us Q, uh, the directional vector of the Plucker line that represents this light ray with respect to the reference frame of the general camera. And the next thing that we need to compute would be the next three elements of the Plucker line, which is Q prime over here. So in this case, we have to find a point. Uh, since we already have the directional vector with respect to the reference frame Q over here, the next thing that we need to find would be any point on this particular light ray with respect to uh, the general camera reference frame uh, FW over here, and uh, a convenient point to choose would be the translation vector of this point from the extreme 6 calibration of this particular camera uh, with respect to the world frame. So the translation vector here simply refers to the point where the center of projection of this particular camera uh, lies with respect to the reference frame that we have defined. And this is given by TCI that we have uh, defined here. Hence, the cross product of these two vectors over here will give us Q prime. As a result, we would have uh, obtained the Plucker line coordinate, uh, which we call L over here, given by Q transpose, Q prime transpose, transpose over here, where Q transpose and Q prime uh, transpose is given by the camera intrinsic calibrations, the pixel value with respect to that particular camera, and the cross product of the direction vector with the uh, translation uh, intrinsic value of that particular camera. So here's an example of uh, the multi-camera system on the car that I have shown earlier on in the in the lecture. Suppose I have an arbitrary camera which I call CI over here. So we can see that uh, we uh, normally in this car system, in the self-driving car system, we will assign a reference frame because this car system will contain many other sensors as well. So one of the sensors that you will contain could be the inertia measurement unit. So inertia measurement uh, unit or in short, the IMU unit, which we uh, normally use to measure the acceleration or the change of the angles of this particular car over here. So this inertia measurement unit, because it has the higher sampling rate, so uh, it's normally around 200 hertz of sampling rate. So this, uh, this means that it's a very good uh, sensor to be taken as the reference frame for the suite of sensors in the robotic systems that looks like this over here. So normally, we'll place this inertia measurement unit somewhere in the middle of the car. A good reference frame for the general camera would be the, on the inertia measurement unit or the IMU over here, which we denote as V over here. Hence, all the cameras of this multiple camera system setup would have to be uh, with respect to this particular reference frame over here. And we can see, as we have defined in the previous slide, that any Plucker line on any camera 
uh, can be given by this equation over here l equals to this equation over here where q would be simply the inverse normalized uh, camera uh, coordinate of that particular camera pre multiplied by the rotation extrinsic value with respect to the reference frame and then the moment vector over here q prime would be simply the cross product of the unit vector and the, a point on the light ray so this point over here can be uh, simply chosen as the translation of the camera with respect to the reference frame now after looking at the definition of the Plucker line coordinates to, to represent the light rays in a generalized camera we'll next look at the two view geometry of a general camera suppose that we are given two generalized images as illustrated in this figure here this is view one and this is view two where we have a correspondence pixel which we denote as x1 y1 and x2 y2 here uh, so what it means is that i have a 3d point which i denote as x and this 3d point is simultaneously projected onto uh, the general camera one and general camera uh, two over here where this particular pixel over here it's a uh, x1 and y1 and the corresponding pixel on the second view would be denoted as x2 and y2 and we know that from the Plucker line coordinate that we have seen in the previous slides that the first light ray in the first view can be represented as a Plucker line which is given by these coordinates over here q1 transpose and q1 prime transpose where q1 is simply the unit directional vector uh, of this uh, light ray over here with respect to the local frame of this generalized camera of the first view of the generalized camera and similarly we can compute the cross product of the the moment vector q1 prime over here for the uh, light ray in the first view by simply taking the cross product of q with this translation vector, the extrinsic value, or, or any point on this particular uh, light ray over here with uh, Q. And uh, this would give us the Plucker representation of this particular light ray. We can do the same thing for the light ray in the second view, where here there's a reference frame. If they are the same camera, this means that if I have a same general camera that I move from one view to another, then the extrinsic value of these cameras would remain the same over the two view however this is not necessary needed so we we'll just need to know where this reference frame needs to be for the two view so in this case here uh, i have the reference frame i can also compute the unit vector in the second view which i call q2 over here and i'm going to also take an arbitrary uh, point from this light ray over here and do the cross product of the unit uh, directional vector with at this particular point usually chosen as the uh, extrinsic value of this uh, camera that uh, gives rise to this particular light ray over here so here i would also have a plucker line that represents the second light ray in the second view over here and we know that these two light rays they must intersect since they are corresponding uh, points uh, in in 3d space this means that they must intersect at the 3d point uh, which we call x and similar to the model the epipolar geometry of the pinhole camera uh, in this particular case there is also a relative rotation and translation over here that relates the two reference frame note that this relative transformation it's the rotation and translation that relates the reference frame of the general camera between two views so there is a differentiation between this uh, rotation and translation uh, from the in the extrinsic value that we have uh, defined here so in this case here the this is a multiple camera setup where each to make up this general camera there are many cameras on this particular generalized camera so in that case rci and tci refers to the extrinsic value each one of these cameras uh, with respect to the reference frame so this is the extrinsic value the rotation and translation but this rotation and translation that we are looking at now it's the rotation and translation that relates two views the reference frame of these uh, two views so after this rigid transformation we can express the Plucker uh, vectors of the first line 
in the second uh, coordinate system. So what this means is that I have two views over here, and then I have these two light rays, uh, which intersects at a common point over here. So the first line over written as L1, and this second line over here is written as L2. But we know that according to the definition of the Plucker uh, vector that we have defined earlier on, uh, that L1 is expressed with respect to the reference frame of the first view, and L2 is expressed with respect to the second reference frame over here. So in order to express both the light rays in a coherent manner, we need to choose one particular reference frame to express this relation. So here, uh, we, in order to achieve this, we will transform the light ray uh, in the first frame into the second frame. So the transformation here can be given by this equation over here, where uh, R and T over here is the relation between the two frames. Is the relative transformation between the two frames. So this means that I'm bringing the any points or any coordinates that is represented in the first frame you know, of the first view into the second view. So uh, we can see that this is uh, generally a six by six matrix over here. The transformation matrix that transform a Plucker line. This is my Plucker line L1 in the first view. I'm going to transform L1 into the uh, frame of the reference frame of the second view. So here, what it means here is that after the transformation, I'm going to call this L1 tilde. Uh, this particular Plucker line, it will remain the same in the 3D uh, world, but here instead of representing L1 tilde with respect to the frame of the first generalized camera, I'm going to represent it in the frame of the second uh, camera over here and the relation here gives the gives me the transformation so this six by six matrix over here can be seen as the transformation matrix that we have saw many times in the lecture uh, but in those cases it's just a simply uh, four by four matrix but in this case because it's a Plucker line so it's going to be a six by six uh, matrix so suppose that after the transformation we have a and b line uh, Plucker line a and b that are already expressed in the same reference frame via the rotation and translation, the transformation that we have seen uh, here in this particular step, uh, we can say that these two, since the two light rays are correspond from a pair of correspondence uh, point, which means that these two light rays over here, they must intersect at a certain point, you know, which we call X uh, here in, in the 3D space. We know that two light rays intersects at the 3D space if and only if this particular relation over here uh, holds through. And this can be rewritten into this particular uh, equation over here, which provides us a constraint on the intersection of the two Plucker line. So here we can take QB over here to be the second light ray. So this would be equivalent to uh, uh, Q2. And this can be uh, Q prime A as we have mentioned earlier on, that uh, these two A and B, these two lines, they are all going to be expressed with respect to the same frame, which is in the second camera uh, coordinate frame. And this means that QA prime would be simply the last three entries uh, of the first line after transformation. We're going to rewrite this guy over here into QA prime. And similarly, for QB prime, it would be simply Q2 prime. Uh, that means that it's the last three elements of the Plucker vector of uh, light ray in the second view over here. And QA, as we have mentioned earlier on, that uh, A would be the line of the first light ray expressed with respect to the uh, reference frame of the second view. And hence, uh, QA would be given by this guy Q1. So we are going to substitute this guy here into this equation. And as a result, we'll get this uh, particular equation. Uh, or in matrix form, we can simply say that this would be L2 transpose the Plucker line in the second view multiplied by this 6 by 6 matrix uh, and multiplied by L1, which is the Plucker line in the first view. So this is L1 and this is L2 over here. And we can see that the relation between L1 and L2, which are corresponding uh, light rays, would be related by a 6 by 6 matrix in this particular 
uh, form over here. So this is a six by six matrix over here. Where interestingly, E here, uh, it arises from this particular component of the constraint, uh, the intersection equation that we have seen earlier on. And this here, it's E, it's equivalent to the regular essential matrix of a single uh, two-view pinhole camera that we have learned in our previous lecture. And R here is simply the rotation matrix that relates the two views. So there's an R and T that relates the two views uh, that we have defined earlier on. And here we'll call this relation uh, analogous to the epipolar geometry, which is given in the form of X prime transpose E X equals to zero. So this is the epipolar geometry that we have seen in our previous lectures that relates to pinhole camera views. So this is the epipolar geometry. And now we can see that this particular form of the generalized uh, epipolar geometry is equivalent. It's in a similar format as the pinhole camera over here. Hence, we are going to call this the generalized epipolar geometry where now instead of a three by one uh, image correspondence x and x prime we're going to have a six by one plucker line correspondences and this uh, where this guy over here is six by one and this guy over here is also six by one and uh, interestingly uh, we will no longer have a three by three essential matrix as what we have seen earlier on in the epipolar geometry for a single pinhole camera so in this case this is a three by three matrix now we are going to have a six by six generalized essential matrix that relates the uh, uh, Correspondent pair of Plucker line in the two view generalized uh, camera. So here uh, again, this uh, Q1 uh, or L1 over here that uh, represents this Plucker line, and L2 that represents this the second the Plucker line in the second view. There are point correspondences in the first view represented as a Plucker light rays. And since uh, there are all together nine unique entries in the essential matrix over here. So this is a three by three uh, matrix, which implies that there are nine unique uh, entries. There are nine entries here. And there are also all together three by three, which is equals to nine uh, unique entries in our rotation matrices over here. So all together, we would have 18 unique entries in the generalized essential matrix uh, that is given in this particular form over here. So altogether, uh, nine from the essential matrix and nine from the rotation matrix. So in total, we will have 18 unique entries in this particular generalized epipolar uh, geometry. And the fortunate thing about this is that uh, we have L2 transpose and then the generalized essential matrix multiplied by L equals to zero. So if we were to rewrite this equation, into a linear form. That means that we are going to express this into a, a one by one equation. So uh, instead of in, in, as the matrix form, we are going to expand this expression over here. And this would be linear with respect to the 18 unique entries, uh, which can be rewritten into this particular form of the uh, equation over here. So this is the, uh, the uh, simply a dot product of A and G over here, where G would be uh, 18 by 1 vector that contains the 18 unique entries in the essential matrix as well as the rotation matrices here. And the entries of these two matrices, uh, the 18 elements in there, they are unknown. So, and the coefficient here, which is A, that it's made up of the known correspondence over here, which is the uh, respective entries in L2 and L1, our Plucker light rays in the two views. So uh, this means that uh, we will get this homogeneous linear uh, form of equation. And uh, that is made out of a known coefficient, A, uh, and this is going to be one by 18. And then uh, it's also make, uh, made out of the unknown parts, which is 18 ve vector, made out of the entries in the essential matrix and the rotation matrix that relates the two views. And uh, what this means is that uh, we will need at least 17 point correspondences to solve for the unknown of G. So each one of the correspondence 
gives us A transpose G equals to zero. So uh, this means that the first correspondence, I have A one transpose G equals to zero and A two transpose G equals to zero and so on and so forth until I have A N transpose G equals to zero. So I can factorize this A out into a general M by 18 uh, matrix over here, which I call capital A. And G would remain the same as an 18 by one unknown vector. So uh, this would become our familiar uh, homogeneous linear equation. So this is the homogeneous linear equation that we are all familiar with, uh, that we have seen many times over the past lectures. We also know that this is a homogeneous linear equation that can be solved using the SVD uh, vector method. This simply means that I'm going to take the SVD of A that gives me uh, U sigma V transpose and uh, the solution of G would correspond to the last uh, singular vector in V that matches up with the least singular value and that would be taken as the solution of uh, G. So uh, since the, we all also know that this is a homogeneous, so AG equals to zero. This is a homogeneous linear equation. This means that the last vector of V uh, would gives us the basis of this homogeneous linear equation and the solution of G would be expressed as a one parameter family uh, of the solution, which we call lambda V over here. Uh, and in the fundamental matrix or the homography case, we know that there's one degree of freedom that cannot be determined in our unknown of the fundamental matrix, essential matrix, or this uh, homography uh, matrix that we have seen earlier on. So we'll just leave that solution as a family of solution uh, because the scale is unknown. But in this particular case over here, we can actually determine this uh, lambda over here to uh, be a unique value because we know that the rotation vector, that means that the last nine entries of our G uh, value has to be a octonormal matrix over here whose determinant should be equals to one. So we need to enforce this particular constraint. Hence, as a, as a result, we can make use of this particular constraint to solve for the unknown uh, lambda in this family of solution. So what it means here is that uh, since this G has 18 elements, I'll be able to write this into G1 all the way until uh, G9 and then G10 all the way until uh, G18, where this last nine entries over here represents the rotation uh, matrix, uh, which is simply given by lambda V10 lambda v11 all the way until lambda v18 over here. So there are two parts of this equation and uh, where the last nine entries corresponds to the rotation uh, vector. That means that we can simply uh, rearrange this last nine vector into the rotation matrix, which uh, would be lambda v10, lambda v11, and so on and so forth into this three by three matrix over here. and then uh, since this particular rotation matrix that we have obtained from the family of solution, this means that lambda here is unknown, but we can easily uh, equate this to be the determinant of R in uh, with respect to the unknown lambda to be equals to one. Hence we get one equation and one unknown, which we can solve for lambda. So once we have solved lambda, this means that we have obtained a unique solution for E and are uh, in our two view generalized epipolar uh, geometry. Uh, and finally, once we have gotten this, the E and R, we can solve for T, the translation vector, using this decomposition uh, that uh, we have defined in our earlier lectures for the essential matrix. And since here, we know a unique solution for G. What this means is that we would have obtained the absolute scale. There's no ambiguity in the scale of the translation vector. And intuitively, uh, we can see that because uh, this is true, because uh, the correspondences L1 and L2 of the Pluckerlike uh, ray, it's obtained from known 
extrinsic value. This means that we just uh, earlier on we have seen that the uh, this particular light ray over here it's computed based on the known extrinsic value RCI and TCI, where TCI is known with a absolute matrix scale. So since these correspondences is embedded within the epipolar geometry here, the coefficient here, this means that A here would already embed information of the absolute uh, scale. And we are making use of this to solve for the unknown uh, translation vector here, where we also know that there's an additional constraint of the rotation matrix, which is that the determinant of it must be equal to 1. Hence, as a result, uh, this information is directly transferred to the relative transformation uh, between the two views. And hence, the absolute scale of the translation can also be found in this particular case. This means that there won't be any scale ambiguity in the relative transformation of uh, the translation for a generalized epipolar geometry. So once we have obtained the relative transformation between the two views given by the rotation matrix and the translation vector, we'll go on to do a triangulation here. So in this particular case, since it's a generalized camera setup, this means that the linear triangulation algorithm that we have seen in our previous lectures cannot be used in this case over here. But uh, we can make use of the Plucker line equation that we defined earlier to get this relation over here. Uh, if we look at the equations over here, we can see that this uh, part over here, it simply means that it represents any point on the Plucker line in the second view over here. This is what we have defined in the very beginning of this lecture of any point lying on a Plucker line can be expressed as the point that is closest to the reference frame. So in this case, it's given by Q2 cross Q2 prime and uh, plus a uh, scale from a certain unit away from the, uh, the this particular reference point in the direction of the Plucker line given by Q2. So alpha 2 here would be the direction. So this point would be given by alpha 2 multiplied by Q2. And similarly, uh, since there's an intersection of this point from the first view, which we denote as L1, we're going to do the same thing here. So uh, the closest point on this particular line uh, over here, it's given by Q1 cross Q1 prime. But in this particular case, uh, we're going to express everything coherently with respect to a reference frame, which we chose to be the second uh, frame in the second view over here. So this particular vector here with respect to the first reference frame, we need to uh, multiply, pre multiply by the rotation. We need to rotate it uh, into the second uh, reference frame. And this is given by the rotation vector. Uh, the rotation matrix that we have computed in our generalized epipolar geometry. And uh, similarly, for the unit direction uh, vector over here, we also need to transform this into the second view. Uh, since this is a 3 by 1 uh, vector, we need to uh, multiply it by the rotation and translation that transform it into the second view over here. So since these two lines are going to intersect at the certain point over here, so this means that uh, these two lines are going to define the same point in the reference frame of the second view. Uh, so here we will need to equate the two uh, points uh, where the first point is parameterized by alpha 1 and the second point is parameterized by alpha 2. So we are going to solve for the two unknowns uh, such that the two points that is represented here refers to a single point in the 3D view, and that's the point where the two light rays intersect each other. And uh, interestingly, we can see that this particular equation over here, the only two unknowns are alpha 1 and alpha 2. So we can rearrange this into an over-determinate linear equation given by this form over here, where uh, we, the unknown here would be a 2 by 1 vector of alpha 1, alpha 2. And this is an inhomogeneous linear equation that we can solve easily solve for alpha 1 and alpha 2 without any ambiguity. So, so once alpha 1 and alpha 2 is obtained, we can simply uh, plug this into the uh, equation, the, line, the equation of uh, the 
the lines over here and uh, to get the point in the uh, in in with respect to any uh, reference frame over here and uh, after reconstructing the alpha one over here we can simply plug it into this equation we, if you choose the first ref, uh, frame as the reference for structure for motion uh, using a generalized camera so this can be also chosen to be uh, p in the second frame uh, to be q2 cross q2 prime plus alpha 2 q2 if we decide that the reference frame of the second view to be the reference frame for our 3D reconstruction.